this is Tom Burnett and today I have the pleasure about talking about first metatarsal phalangeal joint pathology. I'm not going to be talking about the fancy surgical techniques. I'm going to be talking over a patient coming in with a big toe joint problem and what do you do to get this thing better. And I think we as podiatrists, this is the sweet spot. When I came out of residency and I started practicing, it was bunion surgeries, first MTPJ fusions, implants, all this crazy stuff. And I went crazy doing it. But the more I've practiced, the more success I've had doing the conservative treatments. And not only that, that brings in just so many patients and there's so much cool stuff coming out, so much cool things you can do for first MTPJ pain product. I used to think the only thing we can do that other people couldn't do was surgical treatments. But the reality is there is so much cool stuff out there that I was not taken advantage of that only we as podiatrists are really able to do it. I feel the vast majority of the time I get so many new patients is because there's people who are number one, not surgical candidates, or number two, they've seen like three, four or five doctors and this pain has not gotten better. They've done numerous surgeries. And not only that, when I did so much surgery, I could barely sleep at night. I was always worried about complications, people getting infections, removing hardwares. When you're pumping out surgery after surgery, that kind of stuff wears on you. And it was wearing on me at the very least. This stuff has really changed my career and has really made practicing extremely low stress, gave me much happier patients. So the conditions we're gonna be looking at is hallux rigidus, also known as osteoarthritis. I'll lump those together. Sesmoiditis or sesamoid fractures, I'll lump those together as well. Turf toe, which is a strained ligament at the bottom of the big toe joint. Capsulitis, so inflamed capsule, inflamed tendons, synovitis, I kind of rule that all together. And then gout, I don't know about you guys, but for me, they always come in, they're like, hey, my big toe joint's hurting, I have gout. 99% of the time it's not gout, but sometimes it is. A systemic arthritis, and also a unique ones, nerve injury, and scar tissue nerve injury or contractures, other soft tissue issues that can contribute. Let's start with hallux rigidus. So I'm gonna go over the symptoms and the diagnosis of each one and then some of the new novel treatments that you might not be using. So hopefully you come out of this lecture with something new. Number one, hallux rigidus and osteoarthritis. This is pain and stiffness in the big toe joint. This is especially common in activities when pushing off. It also hurts when they put on their shoe. Sometimes with hallux rigidus, patients don't have pain walking barefoot, but once they put shoes on, that bump will rub on top of their shoe and they will have pain. They can't bend the toe up and down. There's swelling, there's inflammation, there's a decreased range of motion. So for example, you should be able to get that toe 90 degrees in a perfect toe, but you can't bend it up at all. The ability to bend, flex the toe decreases which can affect how you walk. Pain with cold or damp weather is a frequent complaint. Development of bone spurs. The patient could be limping, usually putting pain on the other side of their foot, and it changes their gait, how they walk. Changes in activity, hard time squatting. Changes in gait. Joint deformity, visual deformity on the joint. So for diagnosis of hallux rigidus, you wanna understand the duration, the progression, and exactly what the patient's goal is. How is it impacting their activities? Do they just want pain doing a certain thing to go away? If so, you might not need a more advanced treatment. Ask about prior injuries, hamstring injuries, back pain, hip pain, knee pain, physical examination. So look, is it swelling? Is there a spur on top? Check the range of motion. I like to do a gait analysis, but you could always do that later. Imaging tests. For example, an x-ray can be very beneficial. I'm gonna give you a story though. I had a patient come in that was recommended spur removal surgery and entire foot reconstruction, but I pulled out my ultrasound machine and I took a look and there was actually a ganglion cyst up there, not a spur. And I see this actually happen quite a bit. And basically in five minutes, I drained that cyst and that patient has referred so many people to me at this point. When you find these simple, easy solutions for patients, they are extremely happy. So for that reason, sometimes if you don't see anything obvious on the x-ray, maybe an, an office ultrasound might be beneficial. And then I never really need to get a CT scan or an MRI unless something major happens. Now the grading scale, the grade one hallux rigidus, there's slight joint space loss and narrowing possibly small osteophytes present. There's mild pain, mild stiffness, but it still works extremely well. Usually you can do conservative treatments here. 
Number two, increased joint space narrowing. This is larger osteophytes, more apparent on x-rays. Sometimes more procedures might be needed here, but I still think a good orthotic and conservative treatment works well here. Grade three, this is significant joint space loss and about 50% or less of the original motion. And grade four, severe joint space loss, bone on bone. Now sometimes this might not hurt at all because the joint barely moves or it could hurt quite a bit. This is where surgery is definitely a possibility. There are a few different grading scales. The Coughlin and Sureness classification is probably the go-to. A grade zero is normal. So you have at least 40 to 60 degrees of dorsiflexion. There's not really any pain, but then you get into a grade one. You have a little bit less motion. There's a dorsal osteophyte, a little bit of joint space narrowing, a little bit of pain. That's about a grade one. On x-ray, it's not super obvious, but that's one of those ones where it still looks like it has cartilage and there's not a ton going on. You might be able to get away with conservative care in most cases here. A grade two, on the other hand, there's some spurring all around, possibly some medial osteophytes. There's less motion. You still have some 10 to 30 degrees. It's not really the grade three where you only have like a little bit of motion. Generally, this is painful. So there's moderate to severe pain. It can be constant. Now it's kind of an average between lack of motion and pain. Sometimes people are really stiff and not painful, especially if they have neuropathy. Other times they're extremely painful and there's not a ton going on as far as changes on the x-ray. So kind of the middle, it's more of a gradual range. Now at grade three, it's when it's painful and you hardly have any motion at the very least up and down. That's when you can really consider more procedures and more aggressive therapies is when to do a chylectomy versus a first MTBJ fusion. Going between grades three and four, technically a grade four has inner joint pain. The way I determine this is not so much just the bending up and down, but I would do a diagnostic injection on top. If almost all their pain goes away, so for example, it's not rubbing against the top of the shoe, then that means it's really just that bump rubbing against the top of the shoe. The chylectomy is much more successful, especially with older people. But if you inject the top and the inside of the joint still hurts, it's still causing them a ton of pain, then you can predict that a chylectomy might not necessarily be the most successful procedure. And you might need to do something more like a first metatarsal joint fusion or combine it with an insole to prevent that dorsiflexion of the big toe joint. So a fusion might be more beneficial at this point, smoothing out the spurs and just preventing that inner joint from rubbing and causing pain. That would be more that grade four treatment option. At the same time, you could use orthotic modifications to prevent that dorsiflexion, plantar flexion to limit that inner joint pain. And that would let you get away with a more conservative therapy. So grade three, there's a lot going on, but there's still a bit of motion. A grade four, on the other hand, there's just pain everywhere. It's kind of grinding, it's creaking. There could be hardly any motion. To me, kind of that three to four range is when the patient basically says, hey, I don't really have motion. It's getting jammed. I'm having a ton of pain. It's a combination of both. For grades one and two, usually conservative therapies work extremely well. Grades three and four, you can really consider some surgical options. Next, we have sesamoiditis and sesamoid fractures. Sesamoids are the two small bones underneath your big toe joints. They are small, P-shaped, they can easily get inflamed, they can easily crack. When I was a resident, I used to read about all these surgeries. I don't think I know of anybody who does them practically and effectively. So sesamoiditis, definitely, this is something that can definitely be approached conservatively. You have swelling, inflammation, increased pain with activity and pressure. I see this a lot with ballet dancers, basketball players, and especially when you're bending and stretching the toe, it could be a combination of sesamoiditis and turf toe which is the strain of that ligament holding the sesamoid bones. You can do a full physical exam, but realistically, just take your thumb, push up on the sesamoids. It's pretty obvious. You can confirm that with an x-ray. There's a few grades as well. Grade one, slight pain and inflammation around the sesamoid bones. You can put pressure on the foot, but it does hurt on the big toe joint. Grade two is more persistent, severe pain, possibly bruising. This can cause crippling pain, inability to perform activity. And then three is that constant severe pain that does not improve by rest. Every day, it just hurts. These are those patients that come in with like months of pain. They can barely put pressure on their foot. I love the ultrasound for these. You can essentially do a horizontal view or a longitudinal view. You can see if the tendons swollen in between there. You can see if there's a stress fracture 
or inflammation. Usually I just find one of the sesamoids is inflamed and sore. And as it gets better, that soreness and bone bruising goes away. For a lot of these, grade one, you just kind of keep pressure off of it. But for grades two and three, a modified orthotic, getting pressure off of it can work extremely well. Padding can work really well potentially assessing why there's so much pressure on it. So for example, Cavus foot type, a Charcot Marie type foot can put a lot of pressure on there. Make sure to get an x-ray because there could be a fracture. Just be careful. The bipartite sesamoid is very, very common. And people sometimes are diagnosed in the ER with a fractured sesamoid, but they're not even having pain in that particular sesamoid. Next, we have turf toe. This is an injury to the ligament underneath the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, especially when the toe was hyperextended. It's very common in football running backs, especially if you play fantasy football like me. The pain at the base of the big toe joint, it's usually the most immediate and noticeable symptom. As soon as you bend that big toe joint up, it just stretches, it hurts that ligament. What I would be aware of too, sometimes when you bend it up, the ligament underneath the first metatarsal hurts. That's actually plantar fasciitis, not turf toe, and that could be treated just like plantar fasciitis is treated. That is not turf toe, but they both hurt when you bend the big toe joint up. So make sure to clarify between plantar fasciitis and turf toe. You could have bruising, tenderness of touch, and how exactly did that happen? You find out what happened. Were you playing sports? Did it bend? Was it a traumatic injury? It's usually in athletes, healthier, active people. X-ray, you just want to rule out. There's no sesamoid fracture. There's no arthritis, no injury. What I like to do is I use an ultrasound in the office. I check right away. And right away, you can actually see bruising and swelling down there. I did have to repair a few of these traumatic ruptures in a motor vehicle accident. What I always did in the past, I didn't do like a fancy repair. I always held it with a K wire, for example, and it, and it did great. From that standpoint, I always thought, why can't you just hold it straight anyway and let it heal? Again, I'm not a trauma surgeon, so I'm not seeing as many of these as probably some of the other great people. I personally love to use the ultrasound to screen it. Between palpating it and using the ultrasound, you could see if something's ruptured or damaged. But if you do have concern for a rupture, definitely get the MRI, especially if you're planning surgical treatment. So grade one is a slight stretching. This is usually one to two weeks of healing. You just want to stabilize in a good shoe, good orthotic, potentially a boot. Grade two is partial tearing of the ligament. So you'll see some bruising, some swelling at this point. I usually like to think about this as two to six weeks of healing. That's what I tell athletes. And a grade three could be a complete tear. Again, most of these, even if it's black and blue and bruised, you're looking at like three months of protecting this thing. But when I see these, almost all the time it's healed without surgery, except for those traumatic injuries. Again, I might just be lucky with these, but been my practical experience with Turf Toe. Really good products. Carbon fiber inserts are unbelievable. These are the hard inflexible inserts. I like to combine them. A hard metal or carbon insole with a first MTPJ cutout to let that groove hang in there. I have people wear shoes in the house, outside the house 100% of the time, so that toe's not bending. I've seen a lot of these. They all do extremely well for me. Again, maybe I'm just getting lucky. And same kind of thing with an ultrasound. You can take a look. There's the planar plate, and then there's the ligament. You can look for the fluid and compare to the contralateral ligament on the other big toe joint just to compare. And then the big one, gout. Gout is an inflammatory arthritis characterized by sudden, severe attacks redness, pain, swelling, tenderness in the joints. It's usually most severe in the first 12 to 24 hours. Then you have lingering discomfort. Later attacks last longer and affect more joints as the disease progresses. A funny fact is, if you have arthritis or joint injury, you're way more likely to get a gout attack. And that's what I always tell people. Even though you have gout, you want to address the gout, but you also want to address the underlying pathology, which is the injured not normal joint. You want to treat the symptoms of gout and the underlying causes of gout, but you also want to treat the underlying biomechanical problem. As podiatrists, there's just so much for us to do. So what I mean by that is specifically if you have overpronation, if you're leaning on the inside of your plantar fascia, your big toe joint, it's going to be more inflamed. You're going to have more arch pain. Your first metatarsal joint is going to hurt more. As a result, already having that inflammation will irritate that joint even more. It will create even more inflammation, even more swelling. And as a result, 
if that fluid's not circulating, the uric acid is much more likely to deposit there. And I usually find that the foot that has ankle joint equinus is the more likely foot to have the gout attack. This happens like 95 plus percent of the time for me. I don't keep exact stats, but I feel like it's almost every single time. So the diagnosis of gout, you wanna look over the medical history. There are joint fluid tests, but again, when it's red hot and sore, you don't wanna do this at the beginning unless you numb up the joint with lidocaine ahead of time. You can do blood tests, so you could order a uric acid test with your basic lab panel. You can do an ultrasound. I've done an ultrasound a few times and you can actually see the gout crystal building up in there. That is something possible to see in an x-ray. On ultrasound, there's something called the double contour sign. Now, I usually compare one foot to the other just to make sure. If you're not looking at these every single day, then it's hard to pick it up because it's so fine. But essentially what happens is along the hyaline cartilage, you see a second line, that's the urate crystals that build up. But secondly, you also get inflammation and swollen fluid. So when you compare it to the other side, you're going to see that the inflamed joint definitely has much more fluid. And then you can try and look for that contour line against the cartilage and the bone. So what I usually like to do is compare the right great toe to the left great toe. You can see the right great toe here is significantly more swollen, has much more swollen joint capsule, and you can kind of see that double contour line. To me, it's not always the most obvious, but, but it gives you an indication to consider gout much more likely. And at the same time, if you think it's a fracture or injury, you could rule that out and make sure there's no ligament rupture as well. If it's advanced enough, you can see the tophi in there as well. Also, capsulitis tenosynovitis. This could just be that generic overuse pain. When you do x-rays, when you take a look, there's not really arthritis, there's not really a bunion, nothing unusual is really going on. But when I use the ultrasound, you can actually see an inflamed flexor tendon, inflamed tissues around it. Especially the medial collateral ligament. I had a golfer, for example, he used to swing through and the inside of his plant foot, it would always bend. And he actually had a lot of inflammation in his medial collateral ligament. I held him straight with a bunion brace, for example, and he did great, even though he did not have a bunion. You could just irritate or inflame these ligaments. That's kind of where the ultrasound comes in on these soft tissue things. They work extremely well. For example, you can use the ultrasound to do a longitudinal and horizontal view of the sesamoids, the tendons, the capsule, see if anything's swollen, inflamed, or injured. And here you can actually look at the flexor tendon and the extensor tendon. The good news is you can move the big toe joint, you can move it around, you can see what's painful, what's swollen, exactly where it's swollen. So very helpful for big toe joint pain. And this is a fracture. This is of the fifth metatarsal base. I don't have a big toe joint fracture, but this is an example of what it would look like on ultrasound. You just got to kind of look around and see what's normal, what's not normal size-wise, see what's inflamed, and know your anatomy. And then bunions. Just like gout, this is a topic that could be talked about for hours on its own. I have so many specific bunion videos. Every type of surgery, every type of corrector, what to do conservatively, what to do aggressively, shoes, orthotics. Click on the links down below. Otherwise, this lecture is going to be seven hours long. It's here. New treatments. This is where I'm going to focus on for a large part of this lecture. And this is a passion of mine. I like to see what everybody around the country is doing. I always reach out to these big groups. Now that I can make some of these decisions for my practices, I love to look at what everybody around the country is doing, what cool gadget, what cool tools people are using that we can use. Now that you have some idea of what your big toe joint pain is, I have specific videos for all of these. Whether you sprained your toe, whether you sprained the ligament, whether you have a gout, whether you have sesamoiditis, whether you have arthritis, whether you have a bunion, there is specific guides in all of these. What I'm going to go over now is some of my favorite new treatments and new developing trends in diagnosing your big toe joint pain. But if you want something basic, like more specific, check out these videos. I have like 50 plus of them. And my whole goal here is to get you guys better and give everybody access to this type of care. So please share this video with your friends. Tell me if I'm missing anything. Tell me if I could do anything better. I'm trying to do this stuff for you guys and I really appreciate you. Number one, just a quick overview of the more invasive stuff. In the office, there's a lot of people doing minimally invasive bunion surgery. Now this doesn't include implants or grafts. Depending on the case, this has become very popular with the Minimally Invasive Foot and Ankle Society and their board certification. But essentially they set up an in-office procedure suite under some lidocaine. You can buff out some spurs. I've met some of these guys and seen these results. 
they are doing extremely well. This definitely has a use and a place. It's very easy, very straightforward for the right patient mix for sure. Now, no one's saying you're doing like a first metatarsal fusion in the office. The simple basic stuff you can consider. And when you go to some of these ACFAST scope lectures, they are doing small joint scopes inside the big toe joint, joint distraction arthroplasties, taking a look around there. That's kind of beyond what I enjoy doing. But simple stuff, shaving down that spur, potentially realigning some ligaments, debriding some things, that is an option with minimally invasive in-office procedures. But any osteotomies, any arthrodesis, any joint replacement, probably consider the operating room or surgery center for that. Now, one thing I didn't talk about, but this is a surgical procedure, is if you have scar tissue, if there's prior bunion surgeries, I have a lot of patients come in that have had bunion surgeries in the past, had a couple procedures looked at. I used to have an office next to door to a very prominent orthopedic surgeon who just did surgery on everybody. And there was a lot of scar tissue pain with entrapped nerves. So you can do some basic techniques like lidocaine injections, diagnostic nerve injections to see if that nerve pain stops when you inject just proximal to the scar tissue. And thus in the office, with the minimally invasive suite, kind of like for a Morton's neuroma, you can do radio frequency ablation. You could knock out that nerve tissue if you diagnose it correctly with a diagnostic nerve injection. And that gets me on the topic of injections. There are some great injection options now, which are very marketable, very effective, and they do work well. I like to do diagnostic nerve injections. I explain this to the patient. This is not an injection that essentially you're gonna rely on for the rest of your life. But if we're worried about nerve pain, chronic pain, some type of neuropathy pain, some type of entrapment, or if I'm like the second or third doctor that they've seen, this is worth doing. You can inject scar tissue or contracted area to see where the pain goes away. Because potentially it could be a radiculopathy, it could be something more proximal to the big toe joint. Number two, platelet-rich plasma therapy. This is a concentration of platelets to accelerate the healing of injured tendons, ligaments, and muscles. This is a great option. I don't do these as much anymore. There's also regenerative medicine techniques like stem cell therapy, tissue engineering are emerging. This is an option now. These are all cash pay treatments. They can be extremely effective. I've done these a few times in the past. They can be expensive. I'm still working out how to streamline these things so you don't have to focus on talking about money the whole time. That's something I'm hoping to do in the new year. Some of the offices I visited that do these, they do these extremely effectively and the science is definitely getting there and proving that it works. There are patients that are seeking out these treatments right now. And then corticosteroid injections. These are covered, they're cost effective, they're easy. If somebody's inflamed, if they have constant arthritis, that just needs to be cooled down. As you're doing more long-term therapies like good shoes, good inserts, biomechanics, you can easily do a corticosteroid injection. Laser therapy. So there's a lot of great lasers out there like the MLS laser. We had an MLS laser in our office and this can reduce the pain and inflammation. For some cases, it works extremely well. And in like five, 10 minutes, you get great relief of the big toe joint. So for inflammation cases like the synovitis, capsulitis, this can work extremely well. But again, laser therapy, not really a covered benefit. Shockwave therapy, I love shockwave therapy. This is one of my go-tos. But the example I like to use with shockwave therapy is the big toe joint a lot of the times doesn't bend up because the plantar fascia is so thick and so inflamed. What I like to do is, for a lot of turf toe injuries or what they thought was turf toe or sesamoiditis or pressure on that big toe joint, I like to use the shockwave to massage the plantar fascia and the heel and almost right away that foot loosens up. So when they take their first steps, their big toe joint is so much more flexible. I have a love-hate with shockwave therapy. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't work and your machine breaks and it costs you a lot of money. But the beauty of the shockwave is it's just another treatment that you can offer inside the office for stiff areas such as scar tissue, plantar fasciitis that's chronic, insertional Achilles tendonitis that's chronic. It can really work well on those areas. And Morton's neuroma, even peripheral neuropathy, what it does do is it essentially creates sound waves that massage that tight, stiff tissue, and there is a biological response. You release certain growth factors like BMP, ENOS, VEGF, which is a vasoendothelial growth factor, which these all lead to neovascularization. 
improved blood flow tendon repair some tissue regeneration is it magic it's not necessarily magic but if you get pressure off the site if you protect it and if it's in the subacute or chronic phase this can work extremely well i would not do this on something acute like a sprained ankle or a broken ankle for ball of the foot pain what it essentially does is you focus it on that thick area that prevents your windlass mechanism from engaging your plantar fascia from being flexible and as a result when you do a few treatments you don't have to do it regularly but once a week every couple of weeks initially and very quickly that thickness starts to come down you can show that to patients on the actual ultrasound now this isn't a lifetime cure you wanted to combine this with insoles with a good shoe but i have had unbelievable success with shockwave therapy because that plantar fascia band the windlass mechanism the achilles tendon it's measurably thicker on ultrasound so massaging and relaxing that area and as you reduce the irritation with shoes, with orthotics, it just stays away for a very long time. This is very effective for almost all of these. Synthetic joint fluid injections. I haven't done a lot of these, but Visco supplementation, I know a lot of people around here use it. I've had a gentleman come in at another office here. He got these and he loved it, but eventually they stopped working. But for like five to 10 years, he said he was getting these a couple times a year and they did the trick for his basically stage three hallux rigidus. This is hyaluronic acid. It can be injected into the joint to lubricate and cushion. Again, some people are seeking out these treatments and researching them on their own. Topical medications. A lot of the times topical gels like Voltaren and its competitors, compound pharmacies, if you're just sore around the top from rubbing on your shoe, these can work great. Putting this cream on there and a gel pad when you're wearing high heeled shoes, for example, for like a wedding, these can work extremely great. 3D printed orthotics. I just got my own 3D orthotic printer. You can essentially make these for a low cost in your office. Number one, it looks cool to have this thing in your lobby. You can make modifications. And talking about orthotics, with orthotics, you can actually see the pressure. So you can see on the left foot here, the person has a ball of the foot problem, a big toe joint problem, and it's because that pressure is there. Same thing with the big toe joint there. And what happens is you can take orthotics and compare the left foot compared to the right foot, and you can get pressure off there. But you can see the areas where there's more pressure, generally patients tend to have problems there. The beauty is on the left hand side, you can see there's more ball of the foot pressure there and a proper orthotic to take pressure off the ball of the foot. You can instantly see those changes that get pressure off the front. You can see the inside of that arch fills with more pressure. Now it's not perfect. That's the thing with orthotics. You don't notice the improvements like day one, but as a few weeks, a month go by, you definitely start to notice the improvements and you can just redistribute the pressure off your foot. The trick with orthotics is nerves, muscles adapt very quickly within like 30 days. And that's why like barefoot shoes are hard to adapt with. But over time, you notice as you wear the proper shoes, your ligaments, your tendons, and like 50, 60, 70 weeks when you're wearing proper shoes and orthotics, they adjust. And now you can walk a lot straighter. That's why sometimes young, healthy people work really well with less supportive shoes or barefoot shoes. But people who are stiff, tight, and have a lot of pressure, it can take them 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100 weeks, as you can see in this chart. And the older you are, the more help you might need. So canes, walkers, there's massage equipments, massage bars. There's just so much stuff that can help you take care of this. And the one thing I'm excited at is I set up 3D printers now because I love making those adjustments. Essentially real time within an hour or so, you can take a 3D image of the person's foot and you can actually print those orthotics. You can put a top on there. So you can see on the right hand side, there's a little bit more pressure. And with a quick adjustment, there's a little bit less pressure immediately. But then you can keep adding more padding as time goes on. Because at the beginning, people can't tolerate a hard, aggressive insole. But you want to start with a soft, gentle one. But then maybe the next time around, you go with something a little bit firmer. And I think only in a podiatrist's office with a specialist who can make these quickly, this is the breakthrough we've been looking for. For. So if you're in Michigan, come see me and I'll get you a pair of these insoles. There's a lot of great people out there working in biomechanics that tell you exactly what specific modifications you should make for your orthotics. I love following these guides. They work unbelievably well. This has been a huge game changer in my practice and patients really benefit from these orthotics. 
I love my 3D printed orthotics. It lets me change them if there's any issues cost effectively. Even easier, pre-made orthotics. You can buy these for a lot cheaper price. If there's a patient where surgery did not go well, or they're only like 80% better and have unreasonable expectations, modify some orthotics for them, give it to them. This is like the cherry on top. It makes these patients happy. It lets you sleep well at night without any problems. Check out my best orthotic guide below. I actually review all the specific different types of insoles below, the power steps, the Dr. Scholl's, the Atrix, the upstep, all the custom mail order ones. Give the thumbs up or thumbs down. And shoe modifications. I got this thing. I have another one where you can essentially put bunion modifications, you spin it, it stretches out the shoe. You could even tell the patient to jam some paper towel in there overnight as much as possible to stretch out the shoe. This alone for certain patients, again, if a bunion surgery is still sore, they can't wear shoes. Shoe stretchers like this are a couple bucks and it can make all the difference to get you out of trouble. So the shoe stretcher is a great option, but at the very least, there are great shoe brands. You want a mesh shoe box to get pressure off that big toe joint. And then lastly, you want a physical therapist. I actually have a physical therapist that's in my office. They're there regularly. And what happens is if you have two people, so me treating the patient, then immediately the physical therapist comes in and they do their thing. This makes a big difference. It reinforces to the patient that, hey, more than one person's telling me this. It's making a big difference. You can do a full biomechanical exam and there's great apps. A lot of the times if people are frustrated, you should analyze them. At the very least, do it by watching them walk and writing down what's wrong with them. But there are more advanced treatments like the knees over toes guys. So this is a good friend of mine, but essentially the exercise is squatting forward squatting back with a full extension. The beauty of this is both your strengthening and stretching just about every single muscle in your leg. I do three rounds of this every morning and my knees, hips, and legs have never felt better. And you can do this as well with a slanted board or just up on your toes. I know balance wise at the beginning it seems tough, but you can hold on to a chair on each side or your counter or a wall and you don't have to go down all the way. Just start at the beginning and you will gradually get significantly stronger and more flexible, guaranteed. Anterior tibialis. This is such an ignored muscle, even though we as podiatrists should be taking advantage of it. You can do an exercise where your butt goes against the wall and you simply lift your feet up. I have thought that this was a gimmick, but I started doing this. I even bought this anterior tibial crusher and it has made such a difference. It essentially corrected my ankle joint equinus within a couple months. And this is something I thought I was stuck with permanently. I personally have changed my stance. I used to be all about night splints, stretching devices and different devices, but really what we need to promote is dynamic motion, anterior tibialis workouts, knees over toes type rehab, combined with orthotics, combined with a great biomechanical exam. We as podiatrists have a huge opportunity to take advantage of this. Hips, knees, thighs, this could revolutionize getting foot pressure relieved. More practically, looking at that meta-analysis, these things are three times more successful than any type of other conservative treatment. That's why I focus so much on it, even though it does seem like a gimmick. Now back to the orthotics. Orthotics really are the long-term key combined with getting your muscles strong and flexible. It seems impossible, but we as podiatrists, we are the orthotic experts. Let's take this thing back. There's a lot of great ways to do it that have seemed to be abandoned, but you don't have to use foam boxes. These devices are not very effective. I have personally ordered all these things myself. I've used the phone apps. They do not compare to the type of corrections we can do in the office. Like, I mean, by a mile. The different types of aggressive modifications for metatarsalgia that we can make are unbelievably successful. So at the end of the day, with any type of ball to foot metatrasalgia pain, our whole body impacts it. Our ligaments, our tendons, and our nerves, our muscles can get better quickly. But if that patient leaves after their injection or their therapy or your, their surgery even, and you don't connect the joints upstream, like the bone, the fascia, the ligaments, the tendons, the connective tissue, and the cartilage, you're going to have longer term problems and it probably will come back. You can correct that nerve initially and get that initial pain relief, but then get to the root cause. Get that person healthy long term. 
you can talk to them and explain to them about orthotics, about holding that foot straight, how their knees can get better, how their hips can get better, how everything can start getting better. Getting to the root cause, your muscle strength, your flexibility, getting your ligaments, tendons, your plantar fascia stretched, that is the key towards keeping your big toe joint pain away because you are tighter through that leg and that's why it keeps coming back and not going away. And then there's pills like NSAIDs, there's all this other stuff, footwear adjustments, manual therapy techniques, weight management, dietary changes, alternative therapies, like I've had patients go get acupuncture, they've enjoyed the results. They've put the CBD oil creams, there's lots of other stuff out there. But for me, that's some of the fun stuff I'm working with. I appreciate you guys so much for watching. This has been my pleasure to talk about all these big toe joint problems. Tell me if I missed anything. Tell me if this stuff's BS or if it's working well. I love making these guides better. My dream is to help people give you access to care, not to make you fall for these big, expensive, and dangerous fads and myths. So please share this video. Please comment. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. It really helps the algorithm and helps people all around the world. And thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you.